Good evening, and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, The Important Role in History of HBCUs with Bentley University President, Dr. LeBrent Kreit. This is the first program in our series, A Year of Black History. My name is Deborah Hoffman, and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks so much for tuning in. Before we start, I wanna let you know how the evening will go. Our speaker will do a 40 minute presentation and then he'll field questions. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time and then I'll read them during the Q&A. E. LeBrent Kreit is the ninth president of Bentley University in Waltham and is an experienced higher education leader who believes business can change lives for the better. He served most recently as the president of Bethune-Cookman University, an historically black university. Over the course of his career, Dr. Kreit has helped governments, universities, and foundations to develop programs and research initiatives aimed at bolstering emerging markets, entrepreneurism and capital development, and reducing poverty. As the president of Bethune-Cookman University, Dr. Kreit led the institution through an accreditation review that strengthened institutional governance and fiscal integrity. Under his leadership, the university secured continued accreditation while eliminating deficits and achieving institutional stability. In partnership with the university's faculty senate, he overhauled faculty governance and consolidated academic units to allow more efficient operations and administrative leadership. We are thrilled to be hosting him tonight. Thank you, President Kreit, and welcome to Waltham. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. And let me, um, should I open my screen now? Okay. Yes, you should. All right. So we're not seeing your presentation. There it is. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so, well, um, good evening. Uh, thanks for, uh, for tuning in. Delighted at this opportunity to talk about um, uh, HBCUs in general and perhaps Bethune Cookman in particular and any other uh, matter involving higher education and it affects um, um, members of uh, minority communities uh, and other communities across the country. So um, let me just start out by saying that um, my years at Bill Cookman were really some of the most um, formidable and stimulating and important of my uh, life. Um, in many ways, um, uh, an important sort of next step for me, considering uh, where my wife and I were before then, um, which was a place not unlike um, a Bentley, uh, privileged and and wealthy and, and predominantly white. Uh, and so this was a conscious and intentional effort uh, on our part. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what that, uh, what that means. So uh, first, just some, some data and uh, background. There are um, 101 HBCUs that come in all shapes uh, and sizes. Uh, the most important or well-known, I shouldn't say important, the most well-known cohort uh, is probably the UNCF institution, um, the United Negro College Fund, which coined the iconic phrase uh, in the 70s, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, which is still uh, highly leveraged. Uh, it's comprised of um, 37 private institutions. Uh, those are United Negro College Fund uh, institutions. Uh, but Bill Cookman University was one of them. And in fact, it was two institutions, but Bill Cookman, and Tuskegee University that were the founders of the UNCF um, back in the uh, 40s. And uh, that institution is still going strong today. But there's a second uh, most sort of robust cohort uh, for HBCUs. It's the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Those are primarily um, public universities. Uh, the sister organization, smaller as you can see, uh, 40, uh, uh, sorry, larger, 
uh, from uh, UNCF, 47 public institutions. Uh, there are also four medical schools and universities, um, uh, which of course include Howard and Drew University, um, uh, Meharry, and of course, Morehouse. So you may say, well, but those four groups, the Thurgood Marshall Fund and the uh, medical schools and 37 don't add up to 101. There are a number of independent institutions, uh, Howard University, Hampton University, in those cases used to be members of the uh, UNCF, but decided to opt out because of the sort of, you know, philanthropic sort of parameters, they felt they could do better on their own. And those, those are extraordinary institutions. And so, you know, that's why they, they did that. But this, this slide gives you a sense of um, just the sort of um, uh, logos and, and names of a broad mix of institutions. Um, with Don Cookman, my old stomping ground, this is in front of the iconic uh, White Hall, from my former um, uh, office in the administrative building for Don Cookman. Um, and one of the things that's important to realize is that the, the impact of, of um, HBCUs goes well beyond access. And access and opportunity are, of course, essential uh, in the legacy and importance and history of these institutions. But there's also an economic case to be made that sometimes gets, gets lost. And, and it's calculated um, by the UNCF. They work with scholars from across the country. I think this survey was done by scholars at the University of North Carolina or Rutgers, uh, one of those two. But they've calculated 14 point, almost $15 billion in annual economic impact associated with HBCUs. So this is everything from, you know, the salaries that they pay to the secondary benefits of, you know, so supplier contracts and economic vitality in the regions, on the earning potential of their students. And so these are, these are vital and essential uh, elements for economic development and growth in, in, in an often case in very marginalized communities, which is where many of these uh, exist. Uh, they created 135,000 jobs and uh, lifetime earnings for the students of um, $130 billion. And then, of course, and we'll talk about this more in the presentation, these uh, social economic equalizers uh, in terms of pedagogy and inclusivity and community and culture, which are um, inextricably linked uh, to the uh, uh, HBCU legacy. So this is um, kind of a blurry picture, but I wanted you to get a sense of this is uh, Atlanta Baptist um, Institute. And um, I wonder if you can sort of guess what this was a forerunner to. Um, actually, it's a seminary. Uh, and this was the precursor to um, Morehouse College uh, in Atlanta. Very early picture. Obviously, you get a sense of sort of rural, rustic nature uh, of it. Um, most HBCUs, um, you know, uh, were founded uh, as a result of the, the Civil War. And in fact, by definition, in order to be considered an HBCU, you have to have been incorporated prior to 1964, which of course they all, they all uh, are. Um, they were, as you can imagine, you probably know this, largely created to educate um, free blacks and former slaves, which had, individuals had no other access to opportunities. Um, initially, they resulted from the wealth and generosity um, of, of churches, the AME church was a big one, um, uh, American Missionary Services, and uh, of course the Freeman's Bureau and the Morrill Act. The Morrill Act, of course, is the most famous for the Land Grant Act, which created some of the institutions in this country that you know of, um, Michigan State University, Florida State University, the University of Arizona, Arizona, huge land grant institutions were essential in promoting and supporting the early rise of HBCUs. And so here's a data point. 75% um, of black Americans holding doctorate degrees, 75% of black office holders in the armed services, and 80% of all black federal judges received HBCU undergraduate training. And this is, this is when they only comprise 3% of universities in the country. So you get an idea of their, of their impact. Continuing with the, with the history, 
Uh, again, the four original 1837, the first uh, university, uh, HBCU university founded by Quaker philanthropists, uh, Cheney University still going strong, uh, came into some hard times. Uh, they've recently uh, righted themselves. The University of District Columbia, UDC, um, like many, uh, was founded as a normal school, right? Um, a teacher school. Um, most HBCU started as normal or technical universities, really uh, following the, uh, you know, advice of um, Booker T. You know, cast on your buckets and 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 gain the sort of skills necessary. So very technical institute oriented, teacher oriented, uh, et cetera. Lincoln University, 1854. Uh, that was the first degree granting, um, baccalaureate degree granting uh, HBCU. And Wilberforce, one of the one of the few northern, um, relatively speaking, universities um, uh, founded by the um, Cincinnati Conference on, on Methodist Episcopal Church and the AME Church. So the, this middle picture, of course, uh, right there is um, Mary McLeod Bethune, um, the, the history and legacy is, you know, uh, five little girls and $1.50 uh, in Hell's Hole. Hell's Hole was a city dump in Daytona. And in 1904, where else are you going to allow a black woman to start a school? Um, it still exists there. And um, this is an iconic uh, picture. And so I wanted to, to share that with you. So one of the really wonderful and unique attributes of um, of HBCU education is that they fill an incredible void, um, right? They are about access and opportunity and they bridge the gap between talent and potential and the provision of that opportunity. And so that's one of the things that, that makes it so special. Um, they create unique value propositions um, in terms of their price point, you have to keep in mind that 90% of HBU students are Pell eligible. At Bethune Cookman, almost 60% were obligated, they had a, a zero uh, FEC or zero family economic contribution expectation. In other words, uh, these were some of the poorest um, families in the region, and Bethune Cookman. Uh, was uh, was the the university of choice because of the services and um, history and commitment to those students. Lots of first gen um, students. Uh, they are essential today, especially in a post George Floyd world. Essential for the talent acquisition uh, pipeline efforts of of institutions, of businesses, and private and public sector institutions around the country. Uh, incredibly important sources of talent. Um, but what really makes BC, um, HBCU special is what we refer to as wraparound services. So look, I went to the University of Michigan, I went to Michigan State, I went to the University of Missouri, all great public research universities, right? Um, but uh, I didn't, I think it was fair to say, uh, get the kind of support that most um, first-gen students require at those kinds of places. In my case, perhaps I didn't need it as much. I was, I was a little lucky and was able to navigate my way. Um, but if you want to be an engineer, if you want to study chemistry, if you want to be a pharmacist and you apply to an HBCU and you work hard enough, you will be an engineer. You will get that degree in chemistry. At the University of Michigan, which I love, um, if I wanted to study engineering, I never did want to study engineering, and I couldn't get past my differential equations course, what were they going to tell me? They were going to say, young man, you need to find another course of study. Or if I couldn't get past calculus, they'd say, look, you, you can't. Uh, at HBCUs, their intent is to enable you to be successful in a degree of choice, and that's one of the many things I, I appreciate. Uh, wonderful academic and athletic achievement, um, uniquely contributing to intergenerational wealth creation, uh, the community and social interaction uh, afforded by uh, these institutions is unparalleled. And perhaps most importantly, certainly in 20, 2021, obviously uh, what we went through last 15 months and you know, um, 
different parts of the country with violence against black bodies and um, brought a lot of attention to HBCUs, but, but even just the prior administration and some of the rhetoric that we saw um, prompted more students to apply to HBCUs. And so I'm, I'm pleased that they have sort of recognized now what they can provide and they are a viable option um, for members of, um, of our community. We sent our own son, one of our sons went to Morehouse, uh, the other went to um, Xavier, Louisiana, and the other went to a University of Denver on the opposite end of the spectrum. So, so the beauty of, of being uh, in America is that we have choice and HBCUs have one of the choice. So again, I was in Florida. There were four HBCUs in Florida, uh, one public, three private. Public one is of course FAMU, the team here, the largest and really one of the most highly regarded. They've got doctoral programs and a farm D and labs. It's an impressive place. A um, couple of data points. Again, in Florida, HBCUs represent 3% of four-year colleges, but they award 18% of baccalaureate degrees to black college graduates. So they, they punch above their weight class in that sense, right? Uh, in Louisiana, 90% of colleges, but they award 40% of black degrees. Delaware, um, you know, they have one HBCU, Delaware State, and they account for 40% of the state's undergraduate baccalaureate degrees. And so again, nationally, HBCUs award 32% of STEM degrees and 26% of baccalaureate degrees overall. And again, nationally, they are somewhere between two and 3% of universities accounting for 26% of bachelor's degrees. So you get a sense of um, what's unique and important about uh, HBCUs and um, I won't spend a lot of time on here, but just the percentage of black college graduates who are thriving. These are all self-reported data according to a, a, a Gallup study uh, a few years ago. I suspect these numbers might even be more pronounced now in the wake of what, we, what we've been through, but financial well-being, um, purpose uh, well-being, social well-being, you can see that pretty consistently, uh, black students at HBCUs rate uh, their sense of well-being higher. Um, by I'm not sure if uh, if the social well-being is statistically significant, um, but these other data points are definitely statistically statistically significant, and you can see the sort of divergence in those numbers. Um, similarly, black college graduates graduates who agree with the following. My professors at my university cared about me as a person, 50% um, compared to 25%, felt support, 35% compared to 12%, and attending my university had a mentor, 54% to 48%. I suspect um, these numbers, if they were, if they were, uh, if these surveys were taken today, would be, um, would be even, even higher in light of what, um, what we, what we've witnessed. In the, in the country. So, you know, there's data that suggests that HBCUs consistently deliver strong outcomes, uh, particularly on economic mobility, as I said. There is no greater source for members, for certain, certain communities of, of intergenerational wealth creation um, when you look at the order of magnitude from where these students come, the return on the investment uh, in HBCUs is, is demonstrably, you know, sort of objectively self-evident, right? Um, and um, uh, this gives you a, sort of just one, one data point uh, as to uh, the outcomes, uh, especially on, on economic mobility. So uh, something else to consider. And look, it's important to know that like, Anything else, like you know, um, you, you know, the myriad of institutions around Boston or anywhere throughout the country, HBCUs are not monolithic, right? And for those considering HBCUs, uh, and they ought to be considered, but they ought to be considered in the context of you know what's what you, what your options are uh, in this country, and there are many wonderful options. Um, but uh, HBCUs ought to be 
part of that of that decision calculus for those who are, are so inclined. This is another another data point as to why. So we talked about you know many of the strengths and again um, access and price point and extraordinary quality engineering programs, medical schools, law schools. I mean serious um, you know economic and educational opportunities, world class um, faculty, etc. But there are some serious challenges with HBCUs, and, and they have continued to plague um, these universities uh, for, well, I want to say for decades, but really since their existence. And most are located, of course, in the South for obvious reasons. And, you know, the Regional Accreditation Agency, SACS, COC, uh, has been a challenge for HBCUs. And these institutions face disproportionate sanctions from the regional accrediting entities. You say, well, why does accreditation matter? Is that an indication of quality? Not particularly. What it's an indication of is the consideration of the financial stability of an institution. And if you lose accreditation, you lose access to uh, Title IV funds uh, and other federal assistance. And when you educate poor students, um, Title III and Title IV funds are absolutely essential. And um, so that's one reason. And, and there, are, there are optics, right? I mean, it matters if you lose accreditation. So there's a strong correlation between HBCU status and negative accreditation actions. The Southern Association of Schools and Colleges, Commission of Colleges, or SACS, is the dominant regional accreditor for HBCUs. Um, increasingly, a number of institutions are looking at the Transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools, TRACS, because SACS is just extraordinarily difficult. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. So below are just four institutions recently, three of which lost accreditation. Um, all of which, I mean, Bennett is now en route to receiving tracks. I guess we could put Morris Brown College up here as well in Atlanta, but, but they lost accreditation 20, 20 plus years ago. But these institutions recently lost Bennett, Payne, Paul Quinn, and Texas, and BCU. So BCU didn't lose accreditation, but it was on the verge when we got there. And we went there in, a, in an effort to prevent it from losing accreditation. Bennett, Payne, Paul Quinn are all under 1,000. I think Bennett was seven or 800 students. But Bill Cookman was 3,000 students. If it had lost accreditation, it likely could not have come back. Bennett and Payne and Paul Quinn, because of their size, I think Paul Quinn went down to 500 students at some point. They got tracks and they survived another an amazing institution in Texas, uh, in Dallas. Um, BCU could not have afforded that. You know, Division I athletic programs, 3,000 or 3,500 students, it, it simply wouldn't have survived. And so there was no, no, no choice but to ensure its ability to get uh, recredited. So, I want to I want to put this up here and just leave it for you to read. Well, um, so not sure if there's some young folks watching, but I'll I just the possibility of an unfavorable outcome of the Sachs review, a continuation of negative operating results, and the potential of demand from creditors for immediate repayment of the university's borrowing arrangements among other things, raised substantial doubt about the university's ability to continue as a going concern. So this is called a note of going concern. This note was on the 2018-19 audited financial statements for Bethune-Cookman University. 
So I'm at the University of Denver, this wealthy, privileged, white, um, you know, institution in the middle of the country in Colorado. And we've been there five years. My youngest was there and we just, we just needed to go. We just, we just, we just had to, it was time to go. It's been five years. I'd done my term and, and we were looking to go into the private sector or just figure out what was next. And, but Bill Cogan reached out. And so we went down there and really didn't think we'd take the job because there was just so much drama and hardship. And we just, we got there and met the students and we got met the faculty and we're like, oh my God, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta come here. We gotta do this. But this was what was in, I said, look, I need to see your financials. And so they sent me this, of course, and I'm looking at it and, and basically what this is saying, uh, as is self-evident, I think, what they're saying is <laughs> the audit partners, right? The, the folks who know best the financial intricacies uh, of this is, are saying, we just don't know if the place is going to exist. And, you know, Phyllis and I, my wife and I are like, God, this is where we're headed, you know, with this. Um, but we are people of faith and we believe um, that faith plus works um, allows uh, amazing things to happen. And we got there and, and turned it around and stabilized it and all that. But, but this is just one example of the challenges that HBCUs have with, um, uh, you know, uh, despite the decades of wonderful traction. The other challenge that HBCUs have um, is one of governance and leadership. It's no secret that next to the black church, HBCUs are likely the most important entities, um, self-governed, self-owned, self-managed. When I say self, I mean in terms of within the community, uh, in, in the black community. And that has often meant that there is too often a level of insularity and provincialism and also a reminder of the conditions from which these institutions sprung, right? So uh, HBCUs report higher levels of board presidential discord with a high level of turnover because you've got tension between boards and presidents for all kinds of reasons. Uh, got lots of thoughts on that. I'll save most of them for another time, but, um, but the challenges of governance and management are a function as well as a cause of the factors and conditions impacting HBCUs. They report a higher than necessary, higher than average or necessary board size, right? Um, and then the, the quality of the board, the experience of the board, their understanding of the role of governance, and the fiduciary obligation of, of mission-oriented governance uh, is often far too inconsistent than what these institutions require. Boards often do not meet philanthropic, philanthropic obligations that are too inconsistent in their most critical obligation, and that is selecting a president. Too often, presidents are selected based on who they know, based on what they'll care about the board's agenda, based on their history, based on you know, things other than their confidence and integrity. And um, while there's more attention being paid to this, it's still a very real issue. Uh, and, and the institution I was at is, uh, is one of them. And there are too many boundaries uh, between governance um, and management. So, you know, other challenges, um, you know, failure to account for the more expansive role of presidents. So, BC was my first presidency, Bentley is my second presidency, but I've been the dean of business schools three times the size and with the budget of, of Bethel Cookman. Um, and so the leadership and stewardship and need to fundraise and manage and strategize, I mean, that was, you know, that's easy for me. I mean, this is what I, I do. Um, the, the challenge was, was, was negotiating um, uh, that that board 
and representing the multiple stakeholders, which is difficult in any institution, but, but heightened uh, HBCUs are what I refer to as high context environments uh, and they require a, um, a, a, a deafness, uh, if you will, DFT, uh, and um, that's just part of the landscape. Far too many personality driven relationships as opposed to focusing on ability and potential. They are, again, not unlike the black church. You know, if you look at, look at you know, um, the Board of Deacons uh, and, um, uh, and then too many presidents are just not supported by the trustees. There's an example of Texas Southern. You may know of Texas Southern because they hosted one of the Democratic primaries um, a couple of years ago. Um, Texas Southern University got a law school, pretty decent school. The president was just summarily about a year and a half, two years ago, fired. And there were some scathing rebukes and articles written. And the trustees basically said, well, you know, we didn't appreciate, you know, not getting the kind of tickets we wanted to the um, uh, debate. We didn't appreciate not being treated the way we felt we needed to be treated on game day, you know, which probably means they didn't get the they didn't get the concierge service and the and the free tickets and and you know um, it sounds harsh, but in that case it is deserved. Um, too many trustees are trustees because of what it affords them uh, in terms of um, you know prestige as opposed to what they contribute to the university, and that is a very serious problem. Uh, as is the lack of accountability uh, and the institutional uh, insularity. And so you get past the governance and uh, you get to sort of what's going on today and, and um, you know, the operating models and the graduation rates and the resource constraints, the net operating incomes are all profoundly almost, um, you know, um, to, to the point of being existential issues for these institutions, um, they just do not have the resources because the operating model for higher education in this country is flawed. You cannot hold HBCU serving the most marginalized students in the country to the same standards that you that you um, hold a Rice University or Duke University or Tulane University to, and that's essentially what what we do. And you say, well, but why do, why do they have such low graduation rates? Because they educate poor students who come to these universities with trauma on many occasions and, and have to work and, and don't have uh, the resources um, to get through in five years or four years. They don't have the endowment. Many of the institutions, like Bethune Cookman, an amazing place, but it produced primarily teachers and preachers, right? And business people, and more recently, computer engineers and computer science folks, but, but who is going to really dedicate, you know, provide the millions of dollars to build up their endowment? They don't have the alumni base. Um, and so those are the efforts that too many HBCUs, including with Owen Cookman, and I love their athletic program, spend more money on athletics than they should. It's a whole nother issue. Um, but those are some of the contemporary issues and challenges that we must continue. And the U.S. government has a huge role to play uh, in addressing those issues. So what we've seen now, and this is, the, this is the beauty of it, right? I mean, the vice president of the United States is an HBCU graduate. I mean, it's utterly amazing. Uh, now they've got these, these reciprocal and mutually beneficial and sustained partnerships with Google uh, and Apple. Uh, then a record $550 million in financial support, philanthropic support given just over the last year by uh, Mackenzie Scott, the uh, wife of um, uh, Amazon's founder and CEO, former wife. Uh, $800 million from, from Netflix, Reed Hastings and his wife. Um, uh, many HBCUs are seeing record enrollments. And you got to give credit to the federal government. This administration and the previous one, Donald Trump's administration and George, uh, 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 Joe Biden's administration, they've canceled HBCU loans, um, they freed up the balance sheet, 
Michael Bloomberg gave $100 million to HBCU uh, medical schools, all four of them, $25 million apiece. These are unprecedented and exciting and affirming uh, actions that remind us of the critical role these institutions have played. Uh, and the country uh, is better for it, as are the students they, um, uh, they educate. Uh, so um, that is, is uh, both the, the beauty and the potential uh, and some of the challenges associated with, with HBCUs. Um, and uh, I'm, um, I think I had 40 minutes for that, and I got through that with just a couple minutes to spare. And so I'm happy to um, provide any additional insight to answer any questions uh, that you might have. And um, yeah, just the, the, the pictures up here give you a sense of the, uh, the vitality and the, and the energy um, uh, from homecoming to graduation to uh, athletic events um, to the Black Greek life. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, this country is richer for these institutions. These institutions are deeply and intimately connected to um, my community, our community, the Black community, which means that they are also inextricably connected to the American uh, history uh, and community. And that's what makes them... Um, that's what makes them great, uh, in my view. So I'm going to end the uh, screen share and um, answer Thank any you questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation, uh, President Cray. Um, we do have uh, several questions and some comments, so I think we should just get to those. Sure. Um, first question. How do you feel about the Amazon ex-wife, um, Mackenzie Scott, donating to HBCUs? Are there strings attached with such a large financial contribution? Well, I am thrilled about it, as you should be. Um, there were no strings attached. Uh, the presents were given carte blanche. Uh, and um, it, 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 this is a... This is a rare opportunity where, you know, I think you can say there is no downside. But if there were a downside, it would probably be this. What, what this philanthropy reminded us and what much of the recent really amazing and generous support reminded us uh, is that there are different classes of HBCUs, right? And, and most of those dollars Maybe not so much, but even with McKinsey's money, went to the HBCUs um, that include all the ones that you've heard of and those that are in the top sort of quartile, um, where there are those in the middle and bottom quartiles that are just still struggling mightily, right? And again, I, my son went to Morehouse. We love Morehouse. Spelman, Howard, uh, Hampton, um, you know, Tuskegee. Um, uh, a and T, you know, those institutions are really strong, and they're just getting stronger. And there's a there's a chasm that is growing between those and others. And I think that's something that we need to be aware of. On the other, I mean, I was at Cookman right then, and we didn't get any of that money, but we were we were also coming out of crisis, right? I mean, we were just trying to make sure that we could survive and stabilize and all that. So, um, you know, um, but 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 her generosity is without strings. Uh, and it is, is, uh, is a blessing for the institutions, and I uh, fully and unconditionally support it and, and hope for more. Um, let's see. Um, this person says, welcome, uh, Dr. Cray. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Uh, why are there no HBCUs in Boston? Is that part of the reason why the racial wealth gap is larger here than in some places in the South? Right. So that's a really that's a really important question. Uh, I think that um, look, you have to you have to keep in mind that um, these institutions were 
founded and concentrated primarily in slave holding states, right? Um, where black folks had no other um, access to, to education. And even though Boston, and forgive me, I'm, I'm new to Boston, but I, I was aware of its, and am aware of its reputation, even though Boston has reputation and has, you know, my own institution, Bentley, I mean, we graduated our first black student in 1935. Um, and so there simply weren't, there was neither the, well, there may have been the de facto prejudice, but there wasn't the, the statutory um, prejudice here and in the North, um, in the Northeast and the upper Midwest um, that prevented black folks from going, going to school. So that's why there was, there was no uh, HBCUs. Uh, if you look at where they are, um, you know, Delaware, Missouri, Florida, Mississippi, um, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, those are all slave holding states and, and Massachusetts obviously wasn't. Uh, and so there wasn't the same push there um, for the creation of the institution. Um, um, in terms of the other point, uh, do, do I think that's a, a reason why there's a wealth gap. I mean, there's a profound wealth gap uh, uh, in Mississippi where there are the most HBCUs in the country. I think there's five or six of them, and that's the greatest wealth gap in this country. So, unfortunately, I have to look well beyond the uh, role of HBCUs and in closing that that, that wealth gap. Um, but but HBCUs have certainly done their part toward that end to the extent possible. Thank you. Um... Do HBCU community colleges exist? Um, they do not. Uh, there are no um, uh, two-year, quote-unquote, HBCU community colleges. There are um, what we refer to as HSI, MSI institutions. Remember, um, HBCUs have to be founded explicitly prior to 1964. So even if you have a community college that is 90% black or 90% minority, it cannot be called an HBCU. They are called MSI, minority serving institutions, or HSI, Hispanic serving institutions, sometimes both. Tribal colleges also fit that cohort. Uh, so there are community colleges that commit themselves um, to the same principles and access that HBCUs, wrote, HBCUs play. They just can't be considered HBCUs. However, they still receive um, Title III and Title IV support from the federal government um, that I explained that canceled loans and provided cash. And uh, so they still benefit from that uh, support. Um, is there a large online HBCU, uh, kind of like the University of Phoenix? There is not, but but Morehouse uh, College has recently um, committed to providing online, scaled, robust platform for online degree completion uh, effort um, uh, in a way that, that other institutions haven't. Um, there was also an article in the paper not too long ago about um, HBCUs in North Carolina that are becoming increasingly known for their online program. But in terms of a University of Phoenix or anything like that, there doesn't exist uh, one uh, specifically for for HB uh, for for students of color. Um, but just about every HBCU uh, has an online presence, and it just depends on what you're what you're looking for. Okay. Um, very excited for tonight's talk and questions. Thank you for being here, Dr. Cray. Pleasure. Um, Here's another question. Um, this year, Maryland passed legislation to pay HBCUs in the state $577 million right. over 10 years to right. compensate for inequitable funding. Are right. other states considering this? Well, so this is a huge deal, right? And, um, you know, um, this, when I talked about the, you know, the business model, um, particularly for public universities, but for public and private institutions, there has been a clear and insidious and pervasive divergence 
um, in terms of, of resource allocations, I mean, gratuitously um, uh, inequitable uh, from the state. And, um, and they have paid a price. And so I am absolutely delighted they did it. Look, that was in court, as you probably know, the, the person asked the question, that was in court for almost 10 years. I mean, it's not like, it's not like Maryland like just jumped up and did it. They, they did the right thing eventually because the courts demanded that they do it. Uh, I think what you'll see is, um, um, is similar, uh, you know, lawsuits come to the table. Probably you won't see anything like that in the deep south, um, but you may in places like Ohio, uh, you may in places like Pennsylvania, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, as a reminder of that, look, it is, it is easy to fault Southern states in particular for the lack of support. Bethune-Cookman University, which is this iconic, again, a co-founder of the UNCF, right? Founded by, so Mary McLeod Bethune is about to be inducted um, in statu statuary hall in the United States Congress as one of two statues representing the state of Florida. She will be the only person of color representing a state in the Capitol Rotunda. Um, Rosa Parks is of course in there, but she doesn't represent a state. So this is the iconic nature of, of Mary, Bethel, Mary McLeod Bethel. Um, that institution has $50 million in deferred maintenance on a $120 million budget. It's, it's inconceivable uh, as to how they're going to be able to, to address that. And yet, and yet, the state of Florida and Ron DeSantis, in an unprecedented move, we lobbied them. Got, again, I got down there, but Bill Cook was on the verge, got down there and just, like, we're just trying to present, prevent the death of that institution, went to the state and was hoping for an eight to $10 million one time, just, just, can you help us shore up the balance sheet for the year? Ron DeSantis and a Republican um, held Senate and state representatives not only gave us the 10 million, but they increased it to 12 million and put it in their annual budget. So Bethune Cookman University now receives from the state of Florida, a private black university receives from the state of Florida as a line item contribution, $12 million per annum allocations. So, you know, um, that's just a data point. You could understand that it's easy to castigate these states and especially in the South, but, but they recognize the value of these. And I remain hopeful uh, because of that. Um, and if it can happen in Florida, happen in Maryland, not to that extent, I'm in Florida, I'm hopeful that it can happen everywhere because people realize the critical role these institutions play across the country. Um, in what ways do PWI colleges and universities play a role in reparations? Well, I think, as you noted, there are many colleges uh, from the Ivies to Georgetown to places like University of North Carolina and Duke, and again, largely in the South, that benefited directly from the legacy uh, and the pernicious sort of, you know, labor of slavery. And, and in Georgetown's case of providing scholarships to the dependent um, in, in Virginia, where, you know, you go on there, you know, I love the University of Virginia, it's a nice place, but, you know, Monticello and Jefferson, uh, you know, they're trying to come to terms and to reconcile that. And in North Carolina, they're removing statues. And so colleges are wrestling with, you know, taking names off of buildings, how to make amends. And that is as it ought to be. There are no easy answers to this. And, you know, we can debate even the merits and appropriateness of reparations. What, what is beyond debate is the need to have difficult and ill-structured conversations 
um, to help us reconcile the ideals of our future and present with the sins of the past. Uh, and that goes for this country writ large. And those are not easy conversations to have, but they are happening on, um, on college campuses. But there are things that institutions can do. My own university, Bentley, I mean, so we have scholarships um, that are specifically aimed, and we recruit, which is amazing, these HBCU students who attend our graduate program. Um, they probably couldn't afford, but we, we put money there, we go after them, we support them. And we also invested $2 million in our endowment in a fund that will go to support HBCUs. So for those of us that have the capacity and, and, and you know, our commitment is to provide resources and support to enroll more black students at the undergraduate level. Again, um, the beauty of America is that there is choice. And I want as many students of color at Bentley as I can get. And I want to see as many students of color go to HBCUs uh, that want to go there as well. Um, and, and there are all kinds of relationships and partnerships that are being formed by HBCUs and PWIs. And I think that's just a really, a really great thing. Um, uh, this is a comment. Um, accreditation is key. I remember when Morris Brown lost accreditation and it was devastating. No doubt. So Morris Brown is just, oh my God, it's almost, Morris, Morris Brown was literally, I mean, they were, it was like the death penalty, right? And they were, they were a shell of an institution for the last 20 plus years. They have just received formal approval to pursue um, tracks accreditation. So they will be fully accredited and will rejoin the iconic AUC campus, the Atlanta University campus, which is comprised of, of course, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta, <clears throat> and soon to be Morris Brown once again. Uh, that is a huge deal and, and great for, uh, for the HBCU community. Wow. Um. This is a more personal question. Uh, what has it been like for you to leave an HBCU for Bentley? Yeah, um, well, first of all, <clears throat> Bentley is, is really just an amazing place and it's been just a wonderful blessing and we are thrilled um, to be here. Um, we've never been to Boston before. We've never been to Massachusetts before. Never been to the Northeast or New England before. Um, and so, look, it's obviously different, um, and there's, um, you know, there's an element of the community that, um, and the vibe, you know, that we that we miss. Um, but we're here um, because this is an extraordinary place and a and a great opportunity. We're here because we did we did what we went to do at Bethune Cookman to stabilize it and secure its future. <clears throat> and um, because I've spent so many years in um, PWIs, the University of Denver, the University of Michigan to, to Bentley, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural and wonderful uh, transition. And I am, I hope, uh, a better leader, a better president, a better person um, because of that experience. And you know, I would say that about every experience, but I wouldn't trade that for the world um, and uh, consider it a great privilege to have been at Bethune Cookman for some very, very challenging work. Um, but coming to, to Bentley has been just, you know, awesome uh, for us. And um, we are incredibly uh, blessed at this stage of our lives to, uh, to be here. Well, we're glad you're here. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh couple of thank yous. Um, uh, here's another comment. Um, Such large donations from super wealthy individuals are a reminder that the tax structure in this country is all wrong. Um, let's see, here's another question. 
Uh, welcome to Waltham, Dr. Kreit. Uh, what do you think is the most important way to support these schools? Donations by individuals, more financial support from the government? Thank you. I think, I think all the above. Thank you for that question. I think, I think all the above. I think also for those, um, I mean, it's kind of hard to do in Boston because there are none around here. I was going to say, if you're, if you're near uh, an HBCU, to go and, and mentor and support students if you can, to, um, you know, provide them access to, if you're at a, at a company or an agency that can support them. Um, that's great. If you can't do that, then, then any kind of financial support uh, is, is, uh, is vital. And, you know, they'll let you, you want to put it towards scholarship, you want to put it towards books, if you want to put it towards infrastructure, whatever, you can do that. But there is no question the government needs to have more ownership um, because of the incredible role that they play. Look, the, the state of Florida didn't just provide Bethune-Cookman money because, you know, they're nice people. They are, of course, I guess. But they, they provided Bethune-Cookman that funding because they know what Bethune-Cookman does. And they know that's not what Florida State does. They know that's not what the University of Florida does. They know that's not what Central Florida does. They're not supposed to. That's what HBCUs do. And they knew that there would be serious blowback economically and otherwise if Bethune-Cookman died. And so these governments, they are fully aware of the importance of these institutions. And they need to back that awareness up with a funding model that meets the needs of the day. And that's what we're working toward. And, and our federal government, again, under Trump and under, under Biden, uh, have been moving in the right direction. And for that, we should all be grateful. But more work needs to be done. Okay. Um, and I think with that, um, I'm keeping an eye on the time. And I, I promise that you I promised that we would end on time. Um, I think that we should leave that as our last um, question. So I wanna thank you again uh, for this uh, great presentation and for um, being with us tonight. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us. Um, and I hope everyone has a good evening. I'm gonna end this live stream and um, have a good night. Thank you, bye now.